Hi, my name is Lee Smithy. Um, a, a few moments ago, uh, we were talking about a distinction between uh, ideologues and historians, and I wonder for really anyone on the panel, um, how best might uh, organizations that might be considered ideological, how might they best be brought into the kind of process that you've been talking about tonight? That's a very difficult question um, uh, to answer because I think there are people who use history or whose interest in history is primarily motivated um, by ideology. Now, I, of course, accept the intellectual point that, um, you know, every historian, even if it's hidden to themselves, are probably to a degree ideological. Uh, but the question is, 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 is what, what the priority is. And I think all you, all, all, all you can do is uh, debate with people, particularly, I mean, usually people for whom ideology comes first is they, they distort historical fact and evidence and make in interpretations which most people would disagree with them and uh, you, uh, you have uh, uh, to challenge them. Now, uh, whether it's realistic to encourage people uh, uh, to take a sort of quick course in historical method is another issue. <laughs> John? Yeah, I, I think there are gatekeepers, significant gatekeepers inside all of these communities. <laughs> and very often those gatekeepers, uh, are the, sometimes those gatekeepers are, are open to having dialogue with people that they don't necessarily initially agree with. And those are the gatekeepers who then begin to influence other people inside the organizations. So those, those dialogues are, are very, very important and can be quite influential. I mean, I, I was an Eisenhower Fellow in 1989. It was an interesting experience for me because it was a, a single area fellowship which was unusual in that the Eisenhower organization brought to America an equal number of people from the North and the South. And I got to know a whole lot of people from the Republic of Ireland that I would not otherwise have been able to meet. And just simply by meeting them, I got a complete new insight into where they were coming from, what their family experiences were, and what it was like to grow up inside uh, the, the Republic and the changes that were taking place and the way the changes were being managed. So out of that dialogue comes an enormous depth of understanding that you wouldn't have. I was involved in discussions with Sinn Féin a long time ago. Uh, and those discussions had to do with the different ways in which they understood the history and the relative in the which I understood it. Uh, and those dialogues became, were, were significant and important in, in a, in, and were difficult. These dialogues are not easy. They're, they're important, but they're frequently difficult. Um, and so I think you find people who are, who are, who are, who are, who are themselves capable of modifying positions. You see, I believe that in Ireland, there are, people carry with them very significant elements of negative identity, of who they're not, who they are in the state of enmity with, and who they want nothing to do with. And in the two communities, that works slightly differently. I think in the community that I'm a part of, a part of the enmity and the negative of it, who or not, has to do with Catholicism and the church, the Catholic church, the Catholic, you understand, you know, that kind of enmity in the way in which it is said almost. And whenever you start getting, uh, going across that barrier, then you begin to discover that these, this, the people in this institution whom you are in a state of historical enmity with are in fact not the way in which you thought they might be, but they're different. And so you begin to change your own point of view and maybe you change their point of view as well. On the political side, I think, on the other community to which I, there's not my community of origin, let's put it that way, and the negative element in that is not so much religious, but it's political. That the enmity is political against Britain and the Queen and all that flag stuff. Uh, now, whenever you get into dialogue on that one, then that requires a different kind of modification because it's not primarily oh, theological or ecclesiological or something else. But nevertheless, the dynamic is not dissimilar. 
Um, and maybe I will, we're about to finish, let me tell you a story about graffiti and the way in which graffiti changes people's point of view. There was a young man with a bucket of white paint on a wall painting to hell with the Pope. And somebody stopped and remonstrated with him and asked him why he was painting this on the wall. Where did he get this stuff from? To which he said, I haven't got enough paint to paint the hell with the moderator of the General Assembly of the President. <laughs> 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 mm. yeah. Uh, just, just very briefly on you know what John was saying, you know, and I referred to it earlier on that narrative of hospitality, that we can be so much bigger than our own story when we sit alongside the perceived enemy and hear what their story is and understand the complexities. So I think that that's really important, and the work down through the years of many groups and good people who have brought those perceived enemies together, and that changes the story, and we grow bigger and better by it, and also be the change that you want to see. Um, that, that very well-known phrase and you know you've got the likes of you know some of our ministers who are actually stepping out and taking risks and they're being the change that they want to see at community level which gives others that, that tacit permission to take risks and I've often heard that whenever they heard you know one of the uh, for example Trumbull doing something at the time they said you know uh, going into a, a Catholic church they were able to go then and pay their respects to a friend who had died because it, you know their leaders had more or less endorsed it. So it's about not only the ideology, but hearing what the perceived enemy, uh, changing where we are, being made bigger by our own, you know, made bigger, being made bigger than our own story, and then also being the change that we want to see. Yeah, just on that, I mean, last weekend I happened to bring a group of ex-prisoners. I was asked to provide a couple of um, historical outings for, and I had ex-combatants, as they call themselves, on both sides. And they went on a 1798 tour of County Down. So we did the Battle of Sainfield. We looked at the pikes and muskets in the Presbyterian Church there from the time when the minister was a leading kind of revolutionary. Um, we went to uh, the site of the Battle of Ballinahinch, looked at Thomas Robinson's painting of the battle, um, went to Killyleigh Castle, uh, where Hamilton Rowan, one of the uh, aristocratic Republican leaders lived, uh, went to Don Patrick Jill where they hanged Thomas Russell. And I think these things can be quite transformative in opening windows for people and enabling them to pursue a kind of a journey into their own past. Because, I mean, I'm aware from doing this work before that you suddenly find someone from a loyalist background, for example, telling you that they've just read um, Thomas Pakenham's The Year of Liberty, or they're engaging with something on Wolf Tone. And, you know, it, it's people on the Republican side who thought they knew it all and that this was, was their rebellion being kind of nonplussed when they find it was very much a Presbyterian affair and that the major contribution of the Catholic community to 1798 in Down was as informers. And, you know, you've got this kind of progress. And I think that's all valuable. I mean, you may start off with these uh, ideologically driven groups, but you can soften the spirit is, you know. It is a journey we're involved in, and we're all being affected by events such as today and the peace process as we go along.